Hi, I'm Ben Giddens from Goldstackers, and we're here today with another Precious Metals update. Last time we spoke was in June, when we looked at the price action in the market as what had been happening since April and May. Today I have with me again Greg Canavan from The Daily Reckoning, and Jordan Alicia, Chief Economist from ABC Bullion. And we're here today to look at what's been happening since we last spoke, and also moving forward in the, the market, what's likely to be the impacts on the price of gold and silver. Jordan, can you explain a little bit what a Chief Economist is, and what your role is at the ABC? Yeah, sure. Uh, basically, obviously, Australian ABC Bullion are uh, the largest independent uh, precious metals dealer in, in the country. Uh, and my role essentially is to run the education for our clients and prospective clients around why they should be incorporating precious metals in their portfolio. Obviously, all of our clients have superannuation and a number of other investments, and, and gold has been, uh, you know, gold and silver have been, uh, you know, one of the best investments of the last decade. Uh, and for a, a number of reasons that I'm sure we're all very familiar with, um, there's, a, there's a very good chance that they'll be one of the best ways to protect and grow wealth for the, for the foreseeable future. So my role is basically all around explaining why they should incorporate it in their portfolios and, and explaining how easy it is to do. Excellent. And when we last spoke in June, like there was, been through the price action in April, like gold bottomed at $1,280 Australian. Since then, we've seen about a 15% correction in the US dollar price. Um, what have we seen locally in Australian dollars? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I think the uh, when we had the first cr crash in April down to about the 1300 US dollar range, we were about at 1300 Aussie as well. You know, the, the currencies were around parity. Right now, we're, we're back well above $1,500 in, in, in Aussie terms because we've seen uh, the Australian dollar correct quite significantly throughout that period. So interestingly enough, despite all the uh, the negative media attention that gold has received over the last few months, uh, Australian dollar gold investors are only down about 5% year to date. So, you know, obviously they'd prefer to have made money, but it's uh, it's uh, not too not too great a loss that they're sitting on this year, which shows the, uh, I guess, the uh, international currency diversification that, that physical gold offers domestic investors. And I think the other thing to make a point as well, gold's not necessarily a, a great wealth preserver from a very short term perspective, but when you look at longer time frames, I mean, gold has performed um, very well over the past, say, 10 years. On a one year time frame, you know, it, it hasn't been great because we've gone through a, a rather large correction. But if you look at five and 10 years, um, the ability of gold to preserve wealth uh, over, over a time period where the equity markets have been very volatile, um, it, it's, done a, it's done a pretty good job. Yeah, and we are back above $1,500 Australian at the moment. And I think it's also it's you know, in all currencies as well, not just for Aussie and, and US investors. If you look at gold's trend versus pretty much every major currency that's out there, that's a, you know, that's a story that you know, any investor across any developed market or, or in, indeed emerging markets will have been you know, well, well served by, by keeping gold in their portfolios. So it's uh, you know, obviously mostly relevant for Australian dollar people here, but uh, it's, a, it's a, a global story for sure. And we certainly, well, last time we spoke, Greg, it was a very bearish sort of sentiment on gold. And looking back now, it does look like we have just been through a correction at the bottom, and we have recovered quite a bit in the Australian dollar price. We've also seen silver go through its biggest weekly gains in five years. I think it was up 14% in US dollars. On that, the currency movements, like we were at parity only a few months ago, we're now at 90 cents Australian to the US dollar at the moment. Mm. So Australian investors have been protected somewhat from the fall in the price of gold in US dollars, and we've had a leg up in those gains since the bottom because of our devaluation of the currency. Where else is that happening around the world, and what's that meant for other investors? Um, well, I mean, it's happened. The first thing to, to make a point of is that the gold price in terms of US dollars is the most important one to look at in the world because the US dollar is the world's reserve currency, it's the world's you know, major currency, so you need to look at the performance of gold in those terms. Then from your own local perspective, you know, what currency do you save in, what currency do you earn in, you need to look at it from that perspective. Um, and the US dollar has been universally strong over the past, say, four to, four to six months. Perhaps the euro has been strong as well, um, but the US dollar against most other major currencies has been pretty strong. So in the last, say, month and a half, we've actually seen the, the, Euro, the gold price um, uh, appreciate against the US dollar um, at the same time as the US dollar has been strong against other currencies. So you're actually seeing greater strength in the gold price in terms of the Aussie dollar, um, certainly the Indian rupee. Um, you know, many other currencies around the world. So it just, you know, to me, it just goes to show that you really sort of, it's really getting down. The global economy is at a point where 
um, we're an inflection point. I don't think it's as strong as what uh, a lot of the media is making out in that, you know, Ben Bernanke's tightening rates because the US, US economy is recovering. I don't think that's the case. So what you're really seeing is um, the, the two strongest currencies in the world, i.e. the US dollar and gold, which is a currency, mm -hmm. um, are starting to battle it out. And I think that's quite an interesting dynamic in, in terms of the global economy and where we're positioned at the moment. So for Australian investors, it's really been a twofer. We've seen an inc appreciating gold price in US dollars and a devaluation devaluation of the Australian currency. Exactly. Yeah, I think if you look sort of year to date, it's it's basically emerging market currencies, gold investors have done have done the best or have lost the least, mm. uh, which I guess interestingly enough sort of brings back the Aussie being a commodity currency and a play on emerging market growth, because if you look at the uh, the price falls, as you say, Indonesian uh, or Indian rupee, Indonesian rupee and stuff as well. So we're seeing um, gold really hold up well in, in those sort of more, for more emerging market countries, which is you know, no doubt one of the reasons why it's you know, still such a, a bastion of, of wealth preservation for the citizens of those countries. Just to change the subject slightly, um, recently there's been some news out of the Bank of England, uh, gold outflows from Britain uh, into Europe, 240 tonnes of physical gold um, leaving the UK. Um, can you expand a little bit on what's happening there and what the, the, inflow, uh, the, the impact of that will be on the gold market? And where's that gold going and why is it leaving those vaults? Yeah, look, I don't think there's any doubt that ultimately the destination of that gold is, is most likely China, if not China, um, you know, if it's not all going there, then somewhere into Asia and, and probably some of it's still going to India as well. So, you know, I think, um, you know, if you look at the, the demand both for, you know, fabrication and investment from the East that's just been growing year on year, um, you know, for the whole of the last decade, whereas in the West we've seen, um, you know, a decline uh, over that period. And I, I think that it's just a, it's a very clear sign of a, of a transfer of wealth from the West to the East. Um, you know, that's a pretty staggering figure for just one month, over 200 tonnes to, to leave England. I mean, if you think of annual production only being, uh, I guess, 2,800 tonne a year, it's a, it's a pretty staggering figure if you annualise it. But, uh, you know, it's a trend that I think we'll see continue to, to play out, maybe not to that same level on, on any given month. but. Um, you know, I think that, uh, that what's going to happen is it'll get re, you know, probably re-refined you know, down into one kilo bars and it'll find its way into Asia very quickly. But I think the other point to note is this happened in May. So we had the big price fall in, in uh, April and that continued into May, which really increased the demand for physical gold. And I think it's important for, for listeners to understand that there is a major difference between uh, the paper price of gold, which, um, I, and I guess when I say paper price of gold, I'm talking about um, the paper trading that happens on the London bullion market, um, which is an over-the-counter market, it doesn't actually happen on any exchange, so um, it's it's a very um, you know obscure market. And then you've got the futures market in the U.S., where a lot of paper trading of gold happens, but not so much transfer of the physical gold. So. Um, because of the volume of trade that happens in the paper market, that fi that actually sets the, the price. So because there was a lot of paper selling in April and May, you saw the, the paper price of gold fall, which triggered a massive demand for the physical. And, and what, you're, what you're seeing in that statistic, 240 tonnes leaving, leaving England and going to Switzerland to get remelted into, into different bars to go presumably um, uh, to where the physical demand is in, in, in Asia and India. Um, it's a huge statement to um, for me to, to really reveal that, that difference between paper and, and physical. And I think people need to understand if they are holding physical, that the price that that physical is, is set by the paper market. And we're seeing a lot of trading in the paper market. We saw huge positioning levels or extreme positioning levels, um, bearish levels in the paper market. And we're starting to see that um, unwind now, which is why you're seeing the, the price of gold start to tick up. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really interesting point because um, you know, in the last couple of months, we, we're seeing the price start to, to pick up again. A lot of people are asking, well, well, what's the catalyst? Like, why is gold going up now? What's the, the new bullish reason to be being gold? And the reality is that it's actually just an unwinding of bearish positions that's pushing prices up now. As, as you said, Greg, we had this absolutely record short exposure on, on the COMEX and, and on futures markets in, in the US. And what we're seeing now is those investors are looking at their gold position saying, well, actually, I'm not making any money on this short position and I'm exposed to a huge snapback in, in precious metal prices. So I'm actually not feeling comfortable with that. And they unwind their position and that's enough to create upside price movement. I think two weeks ago, we saw the fastest short covering in 13 years, um, which was you know, enough to push prices up uh, you know, sort of 50 odd dollars in, in not, too, not too long a time. And as that trend continues, or if that trend continues, we could see prices move back, uh, you know, quite sharply, um, and uh, you know, it's a it's a very brave investor that short gold in in this environment. Yeah. Now, the the destination of the gold, you know, appears to be flowing from the west to the east. 
Uh, we've recently seen India has put a 30-day ban on the import of gold coins and door. Um, that's after increasing the import tax on gold. Pakistan's also come out and announced a 30-day ban on the import of gold. Uh, what are some of the reasons they're looking at banning gold? Like in India, household jewellery holdings is around 18,000 tonnes, which is more than all the European and American central bank holdings combined. So for a country that's awash with gold and you know, obviously a very strong culture of gold ownership, why would they ban gold? What are the reasons for that? Well, in, throughout history, governments have pretty much shot the messenger and, and, and gold is generally the messenger of um, uh, fiscal mismanagement, uh, poor monetary policy, uh, just generally poor poor governance, poor economic governance. A scorecard so, for the government, effectively. Yeah, exactly. So, with in, in India's case, they've got a, a, a pretty large current account deficit, which means they've got more capital flowing out of the country um, than what's coming in, uh, which um, uh, has the ability to create inflation, weakens their currency, um, and a lot of that uh, capital outflow is, is uh, comes out to pay for oil and to pay for gold. So you can't really stop oil inflows because that would obviously you know really damage economic growth. So the government looks to gold and says, okay, this is gold's fault. We're going to um, try to cut gold imports. All it will do is create smuggling um, and create various other ways of getting the gold into the country. Um, so it's not going to have any effect whatsoever. It's, it's, it's a typical government response that will have no, no real, real not, effect. Not to mention the fact that it will obviously you know, decimate the, the actual gold industry in, in India in mm. the sense that you know, there must be hundreds of thousands of people that work in you know, all the various components of the gold industry in India. So obviously all of these restrictions and additional bureaucratic you know, uh, regulations that they're having to comply with are only going to make it harder for those people to do business. But yeah, I mean, there's already stories of, uh, you know, huge increases now of, of smuggling gold into India. In fact, I read a report a couple of weeks ago that they think it's now larger than narcotic smuggling in, in India. Mm -hmm. The other thing that it'll do, or at least has done in the, in the last couple of months, there was some great research out by Sprott that showed silver demand, physical silver imports into, into India have absolutely exploded over the last few months as a result of this government attempt to, to crack down on, uh, on gold imports. So I mean, a substitution effect. Yeah, mean? exactly. Yeah. I mean, obviously Indians are, are, are far more familiar with, with saving and preserving their wealth in gold, but at the end of the day, you know, silver is also a, you know, another precious metal, so it would make sense that that would be a, you know, the closest substitute for people to look at. Yep. Um, I think the bottom line is you know, we only need to uh, you know, read a, a short history of prohibition and how well that stopped uh, Americans drinking alcohol to know that uh, you know, attempts by the Indian government to stop Indian citizens saving in gold are just are, are not going to work. And, and look at what's happened to the rupee. Any Indian that has saved wealth in gold over the last few months has been very well protected by doing that. So we're probably seeing gold at an all-time high in the Indian rupee. Yeah, pretty much. So, so and more extreme example of what we've seen in Australia with our currency devaluation. Uh, the rupee valuation has been much more significant. But if you've held gold, your wealth's been preserved. Correct. Excellent. And. I guess, where to for gold from here? Like the Federal Reserve has, uh, Ben Bernanke recently came out and said he didn't understand gold and that tapering may not be so necessary or may not happen at the speed that the market anticipated it may have. Uh, so moving forward, what are some of the, I guess, the um, influences on the gold price going to be? Yeah, I think um, it would be quite poetic if, if Bernanke's comments around not understanding gold did in fact mark the, the bottom of this correction and, and the start of the or the, the, the restart of the sort of secular bull market in precious metals, as it were. Um, look, I think the Fed uh, has probably, or has backed itself into a corner with QE. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, if you look at what's actually happening around the world with capital flows, um, particularly foreigners buying and selling um, US treasuries and, and mortgage-backed securities, uh, the month of June, we saw record outflows. So you know, not only are foreigners not buying that paper anymore, they're actually actively divesting it. So if you have a situation where the Fed, which is the biggest buyer of long-term debt, actually slows the pace of its purchases, that puts upward pressure on yields. If you have foreigners also selling debt, that puts upward pressure on yields. And if you look at what's happened in the last five, five sort of six weeks, actually no, probably the last couple of months since the Fed even began talking about tapering, we've seen a huge increase in bond yields. And in terms of what that's done to economic activity, the, the number one, I guess, uh, selling point is that there's this recovery in US home prices and that's proof that the economy is getting back on its feet. Now mortgage um, applications and refinance activity have dropped 50% in the last two months as a result of this uptick in yields. So there's absolutely no way the Fed can really hope to you know, decisively taper, let alone end QE, without seeing a huge explosion in, in bond yields which would absolutely, um, you know, uh, just end any uh, semblance of economic recovery. That's the way I read it anyway. Yeah, and look, I think to reinforce that point, um, 
to, to make it clear, the, the US runs about a $500 billion a year trade deficit. So that means they need foreigners to finance that deficit. $500 billion a year, that's a lot of money. Mm. The last five months, you've had, you've had outflows um, from the Treasury market. So, and the Treasury market is the main form of financing for that deficit. Um, the, the Federal Reserve has been buying $45 billion a month uh, of Treasuries, which annualizes to $540 billion a year. So effectively, you've, you've got the Fed financing the US dollars, uh, the, the US's excess consumption. Um, they're thinking about pulling back on that at the same time foreigners are not financing it. So I think that's a big reason why the gold price is looking forward and saying, well, hang on, there's, there's going to be a bit of trouble here. There's, the US dollar is potentially going to be very threatened. And I'm, I'm not saying right now, but in years to come, the US dollar could be very threatened uh, by this lack of foreign financing. And if the Fed at the same time is, is pulling out and, and, and effectively admitting that QE is not really anything that's, that's helping the economy, um, then I think that could be one reason why the gold price is starting to, to, to discount that sort of future. The other thing um, that we haven't talked about that I think is quite important is that we're changing the Fed chief next year. Yes. Um, ben Bernanke's out in January and all eyes or, or all, the, all the money seems to be going on uh, Larry Summers and he's, he's had a big PR machine out in the last couple of months to sort of put his, his name forward for the, for the Fed um, uh, governorship. He is apparently against QE. He doesn't think it helps or um, benefits the economy in any way. Um, so it's no surprise that Wall Street wants Janet Yellen in the mm -hmm. seat because she's going to pretty much do more of the same. But I think if a confluence of these factors, you've got um, potentially uh, Larry Summers um, getting into the Fed chair. He's not a fan of QE. You've got foreigners um, pulling out of the US and not financing their deficits. Um, very uh, bearish, I think, for US dollar long term. And that's potentially what the gold price is, is starting to, to look at um, at this point. Um, last time we were talking, it was Janet that was the forerunner for that Fed chair. So it's interesting to see that there's so much uncertainty as to who the replacement for Bedanke is actually going to be. Mm. And that sort of uncertainty in the market as well can't be a positive I factor. I think it's an amazing sort of indictment on the times that we live in, though, that you know, as a market, we spend so much of our time focusing purely now on the games that central bankers play. Mm. We're not focusing on well, you know, sort of market, isn't yeah. It? We're not focusing on company profitability, innovation. You know, the ability to cut you know regulations and employ more workers. All of these things are completely you know secondary. If not, you know, <laughs> it's almost like we focus on the Fed first, second, third, fourth, and fifth, mm -hmm. and then what's actually happening in the, in the economy after that has some you know very minor impact on asset markets. So the, the inflection of a single word uttered by Bernanke can have a, or how does the market interpret it, that? Exactly right. Yeah. And you know, in a way, we're, we're not really, um, you know, people are, are a Fed analyst now rather than market analysts or, you know, company earnings analysts and, and the like. It is, it is purely being driven by, um, you know, what, what the Fed and, and what their sort of central banking cousins around the world are, are up to or are likely to get up to going forward. And in saying that, it does create an industry as well. I mean, we're all sitting here talking about gold. Um, gold's been going up for the past 10 or 12 years purely because of this Fed idiocy of, of printing money and trying to uh, support the economy through money printing, which has never worked in history, never will. Um, but that's what, what we're up against. And people are starting to move their wealth into gold, which, you know, is a useless inanimate object. It, it's not it's not productive, but the reason why people are putting their money into it is because the alternatives are so uh, so risky. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's ironic that we sit here and criticise the Fed, but so it effectively it gives us a lot to talk yes. about. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, 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 exactly, that's true, that's true, yeah, long live Ben Bernanke. But I think it's, it's interesting that you say that because when, you, when it comes to people deploying capital or shifting capital into precious metals, I mean, in a way, we look at all of the, the economic problems that we face now, too much debt, you know, an ageing population crisis that absolutely is, is going to cause, you know, going to yeah. cause uh, huge problems going forward. Um, you know, just the actual size of government in our economy now, um, you know, absolutely, you know, probably six or seven times larger than what it was 50 years ago in terms of its, you know, like the percentage of GDP that's actually government spending. And, you know, these are huge issues that are going to take probably decades to solve. Um, yet asset markets are basically at all-time highs all around the world or, cl or closer to. If you look at bond yields, yes, they've picked up in the last few weeks, but they're still, you know, within QE of, of you know, two, three hundred year highs. Equity markets all around the world are at basically at all-time all highs, um, you know, especially in the developed world. So it's quite, it's quite rational that a lot of people are starting to go, well, hang on, there's all this risk out there, but markets are, are practically priced for perfection, which mm. is... You know, it's a it's a very uh, a very risky place to, to keep all your money in traditional assets. Whereas gold, you know, you, fine, you cannot measure it by traditional metrics, or, you know, valuation metrics. But if you look at it versus you know historical observation, it is still very clearly an undervalued asset. Yep. So it's not surprising that more and more people are saying, well, you know, it makes sense for me to hold 
10, 20, 25% of my portfolio in, uh, in, uh, you know, in an asset that I know can never go bankrupt, it can never go to zero, and you know, it's the one asset that has managed to preserve purchasing power over, well, over the millennia. So. And there's no counterparty risk, and I think that's an important thing with, with gold, is that every financial asset that you have um, has some sort of counterparty risk. Yeah, there's, there's a management component, or there's like, you know, who's actually holding those in trust for you? Are they a viable organisation themselves? MF Global, for example? Yep. Yeah. Now, um, we are coming to the second half of the year, and from a seasonal gold buying perspective, um, September and November are two of the strongest months of the year for gold increase in price. So we're coming into the beginning of September now. Uh, we have November, which is a very strong buying season in India. So even in the short term, I'd say that there's a, I'm bullish on the gold price at the moment. Um, and what, what's your thoughts on the, the short term? Like, I hate asking for price predictions because the best answer is I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to start with the best answer, which is I don't know. But um, no, look, I think, you know, as I said earlier, in, uh, I think it's a, it's a very brave person to be short gold in this environment. I think even if the Fed was to taper, I mean, the Fed's the main thing that the market is focusing on right now. I think even if they were to announce that they were tapering in, you know, in, in September, October, November, by 10 billion a month or something like that, I don't think that'll really knock the gold price at all because that was largely factored in in, in the correction in Q2. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually think that that's a, a will probably be a non-event for the precious metals market. It'll it'll be a much bigger event for equities and, and bonds. Um, so with that in, in mind, I don't see that being a negative. I think we'll continue to see shorts sort of unwind those those speculative positions. So that's a positive. Um, you know, my my short-term view is is definitely bullish. I've been buying you know, sort of throughout this correction and, and particularly towards late June and, and I'll keep adding to positions on, on any weakness myself. So yeah, I think um, I think prices will head north from here. Excellent. And personally, I just look at it from uh, the short term from a technical point of view. So the charting structure of the gold price of all the gold stocks is looking very positive. You had a massive uh, clean out throughout uh, the first, well, really over the last 12 to 18 months mm -hmm. in, in the gold stocks and the gold price. We've had this long uh, drawn out correction. Um, it was almost that final um, washout over the last couple of months. Um, you had gold prices, um, gold stocks have bottomed. Um, yep. They the have recovered slightly over the last month or so. Yeah, I mean, but, but if you look at the short term charting structures, they look pretty, pretty positive. Yep. Um, and the reason why I focus on the technicals is, as I said, the, the gold price is, is really determined by what's happening in the paper market. I think from the physical perspective, it's, it's very strong, but the physical doesn't determine the price. So that's why I look at from a short term perspective, I look at what's happening um, from a charting perspective, because that's, um, that's set in the futures market. Um, and and purely from a technical uh, position, it's looking pretty good. I think it still needs to get up through 1400 in order to, to bring in new buyers and get some more momentum. Um, but we're certainly uh, rebounded well from those bottoms um, above the 50 day moving average. Um, so and even certainly recovered. I, I as think well. if we close above 1370 uh, today, then that'll be above the 100 day moving average as well. I think that's where that is In right US now. dollar so, terms. Yeah, US yeah. dollar terms. So okay. I think it's interesting that point you make as well because. Not only have we seen this strength in gold, but it's been over, like silver and gold stocks have been even stronger over the last few weeks. And so if you think of, you know, they're kind of the more volatile cousins of, of gold. So if you, you know, and they quite often lead the market to the downside and the upside. So the strength yeah. in those, you know, parts of the precious metal complex are, are positive, also yeah. a, po a positive signs, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Seeing um, volatility in the small caps, like Cobar Consolidated, for example, the silver play, 20% uh, volatility in one day. That's like having two years of silver investing compressed into two weeks. Yeah, well, they're tiny little companies, those, yeah. those silver, oh, silver ones. Sub-10 million dollar caps. Yeah. 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 But e even, the, even the, the larger caps, you know, like if you look at something like GDX that's traded in the US, which is a, you know, a basket of, of larger gold miners, then you know, we're seeing a huge pickup in that in the last, uh, the last month. Um, which, as I say, is, is pretty encouraging for the whole sector itself. And just from a, um, I guess my question, from a retail um, investor perspective, what sort of demand are you guys seeing for, for the physical still? I mean, we've had a pretty good bounce, right? We've gone from, what, 1,300 Aussie back over 1,500. Are buyers still there at these prices? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're seeing a lot of shift in sentiment towards silver, so silver purchases are increasing, mm -hmm. uh, but still a lot of over-the-counter volume. And certainly we're still above average um, first quarter sales. So there's still a sustained demand. Yeah, right. yeah, I mean, we've seen what we saw was obviously this just explosion of demand in, in April when there was the original price correction. That actually wasn't matched um, when we saw the second down leg in US dollar terms, at least, which, which came in late June, which um, 
you know, from a from a market analysis point of view, actually makes sense because if you think you know a, a proper bottom in a market is not going to be met with a flood of buying, it's just going to be met with an absence of selling, basically. Yep. Um, and and now we're back to you know to what I guess we would consider to be normal volumes, but they're considerably elevated over where they've been over the past few years. So. Um, you know, we're seeing no, yeah, no shortage of physical demand at all. Um, you know, for gold, um, but yeah, same thing. We sell a lot of silver. A lot of our clients, um, you know, have obviously read their gold silver ratio history and uh, are expecting that to compress quite significantly in the in the years ahead. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the insights, Jordan. Greg, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, pleasure. We'll see you next time.